Good afternoon. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's good to welcome you all to this service of thanksgiving for the life of Sherry Wagner. Every one of you is attached to her in some way as a relative or a friend, a neighbor. We've all been privileged to be touched by her life. And as we do that, we also want to think of the, the things that motivated her, that brought her forward in life. Some of the scriptures that she shared with me, uh, by the way, my name is Keith Bultice. I, for a brief time, served as her pastor. It was a privilege for me because as so often happens in ministry, the people you minister to teach the pastor many things. One of her important passages that uh, she turned to is the word that Jesus spoke to his friends at the graveside of Lazarus, where he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though he die, yet he will live. The Apostle Paul also says, if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. Whether we live there for or die, we are the Lord's. And so it was in that assurance that Sherry was able to look forward to meeting with her Savior, knowing that she belonged to Jesus and that nothing could separate her from that love. I'd like to invite you to join with me in prayer. Eternal God and Father, gathered around your throne and glory is the great company of all those who have kept the faith. They have finished their race and now rest from their labors. We give you praise and thanks that you have now received Sherry into your presence. Help us here on earth to believe that which we cannot see, trusting in Christ who said, I go to prepare a place for you. Bring us all at last with all your saints into the joy of your eternal home. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. I'd like to invite Chelsea and Kylie up at this time. Hi everyone, thanks for being here. We're gonna read Sherry's obituary. Sherry Mae Wagner died peacefully on Monday, July 29th at Intermountain Medical Center in Murray. She was born in Provo on March 4th, 1935 to Mary Ellen, otherwise known as May, and Robert Morris Gordon, the second of the family's three children. She married Robert Frederick Wagner on December 11th, 1954, and they lived in California, New York, Kansas, and Minnesota through Bob's work for IBM. They were the parents of two sons, Rod Wagner in Minneapolis and Mark Wagner, Wanship, Utah. Her husband died in 1979, after which Sherry worked as a director of volunteers at St. Mary's Hospital in Rochester, Minnesota. For many years later in life, she lived in Logan, Utah. In addition to her sons, she is survived by her brother, Robert Gordon, in Great Falls, Virginia, and sister, Trudy Rinless Baker, in Preston, Idaho. Grandchildren, Chelsea Burgess, Murray, Utah, Kylie Jacobson, Bountiful, Utah, Mackenzie Wagner, Salt Lake City, Noel Fouts, Grand Rapids, Minnesota, Rod Parks Wagner, Minneapolis, Charles Wagner, Salt Lake City, and Kayla Poston, Jupiter, Florida, and three great-grandchildren. She was a true friend to everyone she met throughout her life. She will be deeply missed. Grandma did not want a long obituary. She asked to keep it short and sweet, so if it were up to us, we would have wrote a lot, lot more. <laughs> One of Sherry's favorite hymns was How Great Thou Art. Uh, it is in the books that are in your pews there, uh, number 86, but it's also on a sheet that's been passed out. And we will be singing just uh, stanzas one and four. And we have a chorister and pianist to lead us in this. <laughs> okay.
Um, this is a poem Grandma really liked, but it doesn't have a title. Um, it's by Bessie A. Stanley. To laugh often and much. To win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children. To earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends. To appreciate beauty, to find the best in others. To leave the world a bit better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition. To know that even one life has breathed easier because you lived. This is to have succeeded. Thank you. Rod Wagner, one of Sherry's sons, is uh, going to be presenting her eulogy to us. It's, uh, for me, it's a great privilege to get to know family members. I only knew Sherry, and then recently, through phone calls and texts, got to know some of you. And today, I'm trying to absorb all the names and faces of the family. And it's overwhelming to just see the love, the bond, the way in which all of you in the family have nurtured each other and carried each other through this. And uh, the older I get, as a, you know, I've been a preacher for over 50 years. The older I get, the more I tend to cry at funerals. So it, it's good to have a lot of you up here doing some of the work so I don't cry in front of you. i let Rod come up at this time. In his book, um, Losing Losing Mom and Pup. Sadist Christopher Buckley tells the story of uh, both of his parents dying within a year of each other. His mother, Patricia Buckley, was 80. His father, William F. Buckley Jr., was 82. Trying to make sense of it all, Christopher relates the following. In the Zen cone, the noble Lord sends word throughout the land, offering a huge reward to, to anyone who can distill for him in poetry the definition of happiness. A monk duly shuffled in and handed the nobleman a poem that read, in its entirety, grandfather dies. Father dies, son dies. His lordship, having had in mind something a bit more, shall we say, upbeat, unsheathes his sword and is about to lop off the head of the impertinent divine. The monk says, or words to this effect, chill dude, this is the definition of perfect happiness. That no father should outlive his son. At this, his lordship nods, or more probably after the fashion of Kurosawa's 16th century warlord's grunts emphatically and hands the monk a sack of gold. Sherry May. Jerry May Gordon Wagner not only <laughs> predeceased both her sons, all of her grandchildren, and all three of her great grandchildren, 
She lived substanti substantially longer than either of the Buckleys. 89 years, four months, 25 days. She had a good run. My brother said when he called me with the news. She's been telling those of us closest to her for a decade or more. I did not plan on living this long. I didn't think I would live this long. I didn't want to live this long. But I have a theory that she kept going despite the immense physical pain and at the end psychological pain because she wanted to stay in our lives as long as she could. She always had a hard time saying goodbye to friends. A few of us in the family are in the business of trying to prevent untimely deaths. Those are true tragedies. Mom's passing was not. So even as Mark and I move to the on-deck circle and everyone in our family moves up one line in that stanza, it's important to remember this is the definition, the definition of happiness. Mother dies. Eventually, hopefully a few decades from now, sons will die. Many decades from now, grandchildren will die. And many more decades from now, great-grandchildren will die. And in between, we will live happier because of Grandma Sherry's influence. Lives more blessed with love, inner peace, and appreciation for the people we meet along the way. Um, Mom insisted that today not be funereal, but rather celebratory, a celebration of her life and her legacy. Yes, we're going to cry. But as Noelle, my daughter Noelle said after saying her goodbyes to Grandma Sherry, the reason we're having such a hard time with this is because she was such a wonderful person and because we're all going to miss her so much. So we'll cry as we must, but for all the right celebratory reasons. By any reckoning, Sherry had a challenging life. She was born during the Great Depression. Her early years were sparse. She attended a one-room schoolhouse in Oneida, Idaho with only eight students. Her father was in a terrible accident when she was young. It nearly killed him and required sacrifices of the entire family. It was all the more painful because she really looked up to him. He loved people and, and was probably the best peacemaker God ever created. And you could see him through her. There was no high school in Oneida. So she had to leave home and get a room in Preston to attend Preston High School. She was, by the way, proud of the fact that you could spot her locker in the movie Napoleon Dynamite. <laughs> when I went to high school, I had to make all new friends. I did not know anyone, so she got practice early on in what would be a lifelong pattern. It will not shock anyone that she did, in fact, make many friends. It would not shock anyone to know that many of those friends were boys. Um, about 10 or 15 years ago, I got her this book, The Book of Me, a lot of questions. I didn't see it until a few weeks ago. So I learned a few things along the way, things she didn't necessarily say out loud. How much did you worry about being popular? One of the questions in here says, I didn't have to worry, I was popular, I had a lot of friends. <laughs> That's not shocking. <laughs> Did you have a crush on a classmate? Several. 
I had three or four great boyfriends in high school. I don't mean to brag, but I had a lot of boyfriends. <laughs> Scoliosis made it difficult to be involved in sports, and she suffered health problems throughout her life. She wanted to attend college to become a social worker, but there was no support then, moral or financial, in southern Idaho for young women having that kind of career. She was candid in this book about not being able to personally relate to being gay, but how much she loved a number of her gay friends. Having seen racism in the Intermountain West in the 40s and 50s, she was emphatic in my conversations with her that all were equal and equally loved by God. Having experienced sexism firsthand, she had no patience for that. When, I, when she and I spoke, she was always proud of the accomplishments of her grandsons, but there seemed to be an extra lift in her voice when talking about the successes of Kayla and Chelsea. Kylie, Mackenzie, and Noelle. She was incredibly invested in our family. Obsessed, you might say. When her grandkids, and later her great-grandkids, as toddlers would leave fingerprints all over the sliding glass door in her house, she wouldn't clean the glass for weeks. And she would tell me, I still have the fingerprints there because I so enjoyed their visit and I want to remember that. Most people might be upset if their great grandson took a bite out of one of the chairs and marred the wood. <laughs> she was happy to have the souvenir. The chair was worth more. And as we discovered, as we cleaned out her room at the assisted living center, it was a time capsule. She saved every clipping, every photo, every whatever that any of us had ever sent to her. Hers were the kinds of challenges and issues that would have made most people cynical, self-absorbed, and depressed. She was none of these. She was optimistic, compassionate, and happy. She adapted. She made the best of things. She looked for the silver linings. She was not a social worker, but she was the most social person that I've ever known. And she worked exceptionally hard to create tight, loving bonds with everyone around her. There are little, literally hundreds of people around the entire country who light up when they hear the word, the name Sherry, because of the memories that they have of her. My dad's mom, Marjorie, was bossy. Um, those of you who knew her would say that's a pretty gross understatement. <laughs> she lived across the hall from Sherry Gordon in the early 1950s in an apartment building in Salt Lake right by the state capitol. Her son, Robert Wagner, joined the Navy. And it's my theory, I never got the chance to ask him, that he joined the Navy to put the Pacific Ocean between him and his overbearing mother. <laughs> a distance she overcame one time by literally climbing aboard a United States Navy ship when it was in port and he did not get shore leave. <laughs> Uh, but Robert usually did get leave, and he was on one of those leaves back in Salt Lake when his mother commandeered him, no doubt in his uniform, and marched him across the hall to meet a girl in that apartment. Now, the girl that Marjorie wanted her son to meet was not Sherry, but her roommate. To Marjorie's eternal consternation, her plan backfired. <laughs> Robert fell for Sherry. She liked to tell that story. She really did. He came over to meet my roommate and he fell in love with me. <laughs> and she was smitten with him. 
I never really heard her sigh except one time when we were going through the through the pictures and she stumbled on a picture of my dad in uniform and there was a oh. he was so handsome tall and looked great in his navy uniform he was kind he was worldly as he had been all over the world and he was soon absolutely smitten with sherry gordon now she was short and thin she weighed all of about 98 pounds at the time um, Marjorie, who let's just say had some heft to her, tried to dissuade her from Sherry. Why do you want that scrawny little thing, she said. Mom took great pride in her latter years, bragging, well, what do you know? That scrawny little thing outlived them all, so there. <laughs> we get it. Her stature always belied her toughness. Now, Sherry had gotten engaged in high school to another guy, mostly because she didn't know what her future was, and this guy was offering a future. She eventually thought better of it. She returned the ring. She felt bad about that. I think she broke his heart. Um, but when she married my dad, she said it was right, and it was. My brother and I always knew that our parents loved each other immensely. Mom said it a lot. She was by far the more demonstrative. Dad didn't say it too much, but we could tell by the way he dedicated his life to her and to our family's happiness. There was some catching up to do early in the marriage. She had not learned to drive, so Dad took her out on the San Jose freeway, and apparently she learned fairly quickly. <laughs> Which was good, because she needed to drive my brother and me around to various sports practices. Um, they struggled for a number of years with infertility. Mom suffered a number of miscarriages. Dad was very worried about her. He didn't leave much written, but in one of the few things that he left in his own hand, he mentioned that his work helped distract him from the childlessness, but he was torn up for her, waiting and waiting. Eventually, after all the typical paperwork and the home visits and such, they adopted me. Mom. Mom called it God's little detour. I was, I was not able to have children at the time. She began telling me as early as I was able to understand. She looked at me very directly every time she told me this. But I am convinced that you were meant to be in our family. So God found a way to get you to us. I don't know that I necessarily believe that, but I never doubted that she believed it and that meant the world to me. Two years later, after suffering yet another miscarriage in between, she was able to have my brother Mark. And so we were fully constituted as a family. People who are raised by neglectful or mean parents will often comment years later that they didn't fully realize what they were missing because they had no frame of reference. No alternative parents against which to compare. Mark and I had the polar opposite experience. We didn't know until years later how good we had it. We assumed everyone had a mom like ours. The word mother to us has always denoted unconditional love, unwavering support, belief in our abilities, endless encouragement, self-sacrifice, home-cooked meals morning and evening with a little surprise or a note in your lunchbox, 
and frequent, almost smotheringly tight hugs. Mom had an overarching cause and effect theory about human nature and human behavior. Whenever she encountered news of someone acting cruel or unfeeling, she would remark, his mother probably didn't hug him enough when he was little. Now for years I thought this was folksy and touching, but grossly simple, simplistic. You can imagine my surprise decades later when doing research on collaboration and working together to run across a slew of studies in the peer-reviewed research indicating that the sense of, a, of security a parent instills in a child has lifelong implications for how caring, how collaborative, or even how altruistic and charitable he or she will be throughout his or her entire life. And now when I watch malcontents raging on the news, I recognize that the world is indeed suffering a severe deficit of hugs. Mom was profoundly correct. Her level of concern with other people's happiness was legendary. She was in fact one of those rare, very rare people, they've done research on this and they are in fact rare, who puts the interest of other people, their well-being above her own. In our family, we did Christmas presents in the morning in pajamas, and afterwards we'd go upstairs to, to shower and get dressed. One Christmas, she and dad got me two very nice flannel shirts. After my shower, I put on one of them. I came downstairs, walked into the kitchen. She says, oh, you don't like the other one? <laughs> I just looked at her, then we laughed. We've laughed about that quite a lot through the years. But it, was, it seemed to me it was indicative of her concern, like, did, did you really like both shirts? Yes, Mom, I just can't wear both of them at the same time. <laughs> um, after leaving the Navy, Dad worked for IBM his entire career. Dark suit, white shirt. IBM used to call it a sincere tie. I don't know what that means. A briefcase, regular commute into the office, the whole deal, including legendary regular moves around the country. Mark and I eventually saw them coming. Boys, sit down, we need to talk. Mark and I would look at each other, do a quick check of the calendar, how long has it been, two years, here we go again. We started in San Jose and Sacramento, then Endwell, New York, then Topeka, Kansas, then Rochester, Minnesota, then Somers, New York, then back to Rochester. Mom herself did 28 moves during the course of her life, as she wrote in this book, far too many. We were a cohesive family. We had to be. Beyond our longtime IBM friends, who we would bump into from, from one market to another, we would briefly have only each other. Dad would move first and start work, take a hotel room or an apartment, before the moving van came for our stuff and we caught a flight out. To watch mom hit the ground in a new town was a wonder to behold. Green Berets and Navy SEALs have got nothing on Sherry Wagner for conducting tennis shoes on the ground recon. <laughs> Every room in the house would still be stacked with boxes, North American van lines, Mayfair van lines, different van lines every time, all those stickers on every piece of furniture, which we hadn't even moved in yet. But she already knew and was fast friends with every adjoining neighbor. And she knew things about them and she knew who had boys our age and something that we could latch on to to start a friendship. The phone would be ringing. I learned, I tried not to answer the phone. It was never for me, it was always for her. Pick it up, is Sherry there? Just a second, mom. And there would be all these knocks on the door. People would just open the door, Sherry. And then I'd hear her yell across the house, oh, Kathy, oh, Susan, come in. Would you like a cup of coffee? Sit down, let's visit. And to us as boys, we just roll our eyes like, oh my gosh, it's like Grand Central Station in here. Um, 
I was always happy with each move, she wrote in this book. We always had very nice homes, and I loved the challenge of meeting new people. I also loved living by people who had different nationalities and backgrounds. New York was special because people were from all over the world. I tried to bloom where we were planted. I can't remember a neighborhood that we didn't have close friends, and that's absolutely true. Not only close friends, but quick friends. That was the hardest part about moving so often, as we always had to leave good friends behind. As I said, that's my theory as to why she lived as long as she did. She did not want to leave good friends behind. And if anyone, if the roles were reversed, if everyone, anyone ever moved into our neighborhood, oh my gosh, she immediately set to baking cookies or brownies. She'd grab my brother and me. We were reluctant. Do we have to? Yes, you have to. The three of us would march down a house or two, wherever the moving, the moving van was usually still there. Hi, I'm Sherry Wagner, and these are my sons, Mark and Rod. If you, we are excited to have you as our neighbors. If you need anything at all, you just let us know. Within days of moving in, we would be invited to someone's house or they would be at ours. People have often asked me if moving so much was hard, and yes, it was. Parts of it were, but wow, did mom ever make it a lot easier and more of an adventure. Um, Dad, unfortunately, smoked since the age of 15. He could do anything. I saw him build a color TV from Heath kit boxes that arrived over the course of an entire year, but he could not throw that habit. I tried to, I watched him try every trick in the book and they didn't work. I mean, when he was working in White Plains, New York, he, um, the stress of the job had him smoking more. My mom was worried about him. He decided to request his first lateral move at IBM, and they granted it back to IBM, a town we loved, to be head of the media, media center at the big blue complex northwest of town. They found a log home north of town in Orinoco. It was going to be the house where they would finish out his career, and they would eventually retire. In June of 1979, we all piled in the car so we could drive me out here to Utah for college, a drive that we have done on Interstate 80 dozens of times that a number of the kids replicated a few weeks ago to return her body to Rochester. On the way back, Dad fell ill. In fact, Mom said when I interviewed her about it years later that they didn't even go home. They, went, they drove straight to the Mayo Clinic, and he was diagnosed with a particularly aggressive form of lung cancer. He passed away. Five months later, mom never fully recovered from dad's death. A photo of dad was always nearby, in her house, in the assisted living center, everywhere she lived. Most days she wore a necklace that dad gave her, engraved, you mean the world to me. She left a part of herself there at Grandview Memorial Gardens in Rochester, and so it was fitting that two weeks ago we, her sons, her grandchildren, and her great-grandchildren returned her there to be buried next to the man she loved so much who meant the world to her. It won't surprise anyone that mom channeled her grief into helping others. In 1980, she formed a support group in Rochester for widows, particularly those who were widowed too young. That group continues today to support people who have been widowed. And so it's part of how she lives on. After my dad died, Mom and I got into a pattern of talking roughly once a week, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. Rarely would we ever go two weeks between calls. So if you do the math on that, it makes for 2,300 phone calls 
in the intervening years. We talked about everything. We talked about politics. We talked about religion. We talked a lot about the grandkids. How are Noel and Derek? How are Parks and Brenna? How are Chuck and Macy? She was like a sponge. Please tell me, how is everybody? Are they happy? And our best phone calls is when I could report, everybody's good, everybody's doing well. And then she was at peace. These calls would run 35, 45 minutes. Eventually, I'd say, well, I, I probably had to get back to things. Yes, I suppose I should also. Thank you for calling. It's been good to catch up with you. Okay, we'll talk again soon. Yes, we will. Goodbye, honey. Goodbye. Love you, Mom. I love you too. It's gonna be a bear of a habit to break. I've already lost track of the number of times in the weeks since she passed away that I've thought I should call my, oh. A few days ago, I took some photos of my grandson playing hockey, leaving the arena. I had a reflex. I need to upload these to her picture frame so that, oh, ouch. That's gonna hurt. I suspect I will have, I suspect we all will have a year or so of those reflexes where we wanna talk to Grandma Sherry. It struck me a few days ago, thinking of our phone calls, that I not only lost my mom, but I've lost one of my closest friends. And I know that I speak for all of us in that regard. We mourn the loss of a very dear friend, but the depth of our mourning is also the height of our celebration. She would have wanted it that way, that we were so blessed to have had her in our lives. It hurts so much because she meant so much. But if her beliefs in an afterlife are correct, she just might have been at Liam's hockey practice. Maybe she's here today. I don't know. But I know it was her faith that she could be. And if she is, I guarantee that she is celebrating. The end of her pain, her reuniting with dad. The fact that we are all together here as loving friends and family, and that we hold her in such high regard. It seems most appropriate that I close simply by quoting directly from her describing herself and talking about her life's philosophy. I try to smile at everyone I meet. I am outgoing, she wrote here when they asked her to describe herself. A lesson she said she learned from her father, listen to all sides, be kind to everyone. I do not really harbor resentment. I just remove myself from the situation. I believe strongly in heaven. Hell is God's business, who knows? What do you think will happen to you when you die? This book asks. I plan to go to heaven because I believe in Jesus Christ. When we talked a couple years ago about her funeral, she was emphatic that to make sure that everyone knew that she believed in Jesus Christ and that she tried to follow his example. So I hope we're good there. I just want to stay out of trouble with my mom. <laughs> How would you like to be remembered? As a mild-mannered woman who tried to love and make everyone feel comfortable. There's a number of questions in here and then one at the end says, what do you want to, what else do I want to ask myself? Did I express my love for my children so they really understand 
how much I loved them. Really, Mom? I think you covered it. Who are you? A child of God, a mother, a grandmother, a sister, a friend, a comforter, a listener. Rest in peace, Mom. Thank you for blessing our lives. We love you. You will be deeply, deeply missed. Thank you so much, Rod. Wanted to include a little bit of time for any family or friends who wanted to mention something they wanted to share in memory of, of Sherry. <clears throat> we also know that your ability to listen is limited by the length you sit here. So I invite, uh, we'll, we'll be giving about 10 minutes for that and I'll invite anyone who wants to share a little bit to come forward at this time. I'm here today to represent my mom, who had such a beautiful relationship with Sherry. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry. Um, I I asked my family if they if uh, they wanted to give me just some little memories or whatnot of Sherry that I could share with you today and and then I just summarized it because it was interesting how we all we all had the same thing to say about Sherry. Um, she was very service oriented and she loved people and people loved Sherry. Um, so I just threw together just a brief synopsis of um, of what we all had to say. So my journey in life with Sherry started when I was 12. Sherry was living in New York at that time, and it was decided that I should go visit Sherry. I'm still not exactly sure how that decision came about. Nobody ever asked me. But I was put on an airplane, doted over by the airline attendants, and picked up by Uncle Bob when I arrived in New York. Um, here in my life, experiences with Aunt Sherry began. And this was the first opportunity I had to really know Sherry and her delightful personality. I could tell from the many friends that she introduced me to that people loved Sherry. Um, over the years, Sherry and I had many conversations about her director of volunteers position that she held in Minnesota. The position provided many opportunities for others to experience Sherry's love, her caring nature, and her ability to help others in grieving situations. Sherry could have been a professional counselor. She held this position for many in my family. She was easy to visit with, and her many life experiences helped her offer loving advice. She told me on many occasions, so-and-so stopped by today. We had a really good talk. I hope our talk was able to help them. Again, while living in Montana, Sherry's love for people and her compassionate service was experienced by many. She had so many stories to tell of all the times that people were in need and she was there to step in, offer her love and support, provide a meal, or just offer a loving hand. She was able to visit the Holy Lands and, the, and Russia, where she was able to offer her love and compassion there to so many that were in need. Sherry had a deep love for Montana. She loved the area, she loved the people, and especially her close friend, Jannie. This past June, I had the opportunity to return to Montana with Sherry and visit some of the most cherished places. 
She told me this trip brought, brought much peace to her soul. As she was able to visit the church where she spent so much time while living there, as well as visiting the resting place of her dear friend, Jenny. Sherry was an, a very unselfish person. She spent many years taking care of her aging parents. This required constant care, and she did it never complaining, always putting their needs above her own. Over the last few years, I've been able to return some of that care to Sherry by helping her with her day-to-day -day tasks. This gave me the opportunity for many long talks with Sherry about God, and here in the end, death in general. Sherry knew God. She loved her Savior, and she wasn't afraid of death. She told me several times, I know where I'm going. I know what is waiting for me, and I'm not afraid. I just hope that I don't have to suffer long and hard in order to leave this world. How grateful I am that I was able to hold her hand and watch her slip away quickly and peacefully. Sherry's life has been filled with medical problems from a very young age. She battled them all with strength and courage, including her battle with diabetes, which she managed so well. When I donated her diabetic supplies back to her favorite dietitian, his response summed up Sherry's life. Isn't it just amazing that Sherry spent so much of her life helping others, and now, even after she's gone, she continues to bless the lives of others? What a beautiful tribute and truly identifies Sherry's life and the effect that she had on so many people. We love you, Aunt Sherry. And we look forward to that day that we can all hug you once again. Liam wants to share his favorite memory of Grandma Sherry. Liam had a special name from Grandma Sherry, and she, she called me my sweetheart. <laughs> And he loved her very much. She used to call him and check on him and send him cards, huh? Yeah. Yeah. We'll miss her. So Sherry was Aunt Sherry to me, and you know, when these loved ones up and decide that it's time to leave here, the only thing that they really leave us that's worth hanging on to is the memories. So. I've always tried to make sure that I hold on to these memories, and I remember something about each and every one, and it's easier with some than others. But So I spent a whole week at work, and I was struggling. I could not, I could not find what, what memory is she leaving me with. And I went back to Minnesota when I was, I was probably 13 or so, I thought, what did I do back, what happened back there? And the only thing that I could remember about that was Mark thinking he had a fast car and he could really shift gears. 
but I, he's probably gotten better at it now. <laughs> I thought it was pretty neat, though. But then it hit me. Um, and and I'm, I think all you are going to be able to relate to this with Aunt Sherry. Never once did I call or my wife call. And you, so when you make a phone call, you say, you know, usually it's, hello, this is Richard. How are you doing today? Nope. You couldn't beat her to it. And she did it every time. She would say, you'd say, hello, Aunt Sherry, this is Richard. Oh, Richard, how are you today? She had the subject completely turned before you could get another word out onto how you were doing, not how, how was she doing it. it was always, and she would lead the conversation to be about you, not her. And I, I, I honestly believe that in thinking about it, you know, I can just see her in Poulsen and I could see him coming home and eat on Sunday. And him saying, the pastor saying, boy, I really packed him in this week with that speech I gave last week. And she just didn't have the heart to say, eh, after you bored him for an hour, they were there to visit me. Because <laughs> she was that kind of person. So this poem is called Legacy. Um, it's by Lois Gano Schiller, who I don't know, but it was a close friend of Sherry's, um, and she was a member of the Presbyterian Church. And I think it's also in the program. If love survives each trial and test, will I really be gone? <laughs> Although my body lies at rest, <laughs> will treasures linger on? was all my life to no avail, unsatisfied and hollow? Or did I pioneer a trail which you might choose to follow? Did I practice push and shove? Or did I try to give? Was my life a life of love? A choice of how to live? When I have left you, do not grieve. My spirit is not far. And hopefully the love I leave, hopefully the love I lay, leave forms part of what you are. Thank you, Noel. Your, the family memories and the sharing that you've all done with me today clarify when I met with Sherry, when she asked me to come and tell me, told me that she was writing down that I would be uh, participating in the service, the question I had is, well, do you have a favorite scripture? And uh, as you all know about Sherry, she never had to stop and think about it. She just said, well, of course, John 3.16. And uh, if you don't happen to have your Bibles handy or don't have that verse memorized, it's for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And every word of that verse touches every part of what each of you said about Sherry today. The foundation of that verse is that God loved. And that love was not limited, it loves the world. This is in John, the book of John, where he talks about the world. 
the world where there is uh, hostility and conflict and where there is division and where there is loss. But in that world, God sent his son. And he sent that son out of love, a love that wasn't constrained by any way. And it was his desire to pull to himself those who had lost love, who had not had that closeness that so many of you are experiencing with Sherry. We talk at a time like this about who a person is. And it's good when we're celebrating life, let's talk about who we're celebrating. And we talk about how a person lived. And that's really good to do too, when we're talking about a life and celebrating a life, how did they live? But beyond and behind all that, and what I know Sherry wanted to convey, and some of you already touched it, she wanted to convey why she lived as she did. And the reason why was because God loved her and gave his son to be her savior. And it isn't just an individual thing that she herself experienced the savior, but she saw that that love reached out to touch other people as well. So she didn't see the color of your skin. She didn't see your educational achievement. She didn't see your income level. She didn't see any of those external things, but saw that when God looks at you, he sees you as a member of the family that he is forming. She herself experienced being in that family when she knew the love of Jesus reached her and gave her a certainty that she was in God's hands. She belonged to him and she could not be separated from the love of God. That kind of confidence is awesome. It's a great experience for me to know Sherry, to hear her testimony. And that testimony was never about me and my God. It was always about how everybody needs to know about this wonderful Lord. And I'm sure you all heard that from her at different times because she didn't keep it to herself. We are privileged to be able to commemorate that life and to think not only of what she did, but what motivated her and what empowered her. At the center of things, when God gave his only son for us so that we might not perish, but have everlasting life, we're looking at that line that goes through time and at the height of that line is the cross. And on one side are the forces of darkness the forces of hate and division symbolized by death. And on the other side is the love of God who did not withhold his own dear son and gave him freely that whoever believes in him will have life. And so he who died on that cross faced death, entered into the realm of death and broke the door because he could, he is life. He is life in the face of death and death could not overcome him. And his promise to us is that believing in him, you have eternal life. That is the promise to all of us. I'm so grateful to have known Sherry. I'm so grateful to meet all of you and to share with you today sorrow, but also joy. The joy that we know she is free from pain and she's in the presence of her savior. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the life of Sherry. We thank you for the testimony of that life as we see it lived out in the lives of her sons, her grandchildren, and her great-grandchildren. We thank you for the testimony of that life as we see it throughout this room in the lives of her friends. We thank you for the faithfulness with which she lived, her willingness to touch others, to care for others. We thank you, Lord, that her testimony leads us on, and we pray that our eyes may be as open as hers were to your love for others. We thank you, God, that you speak to us in our sorrow, you speak to us in our joy, you speak to us in our fellowship. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. 
May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. This concludes our service.